Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iTunes number one kids and family podcast. We are so excited. STEM Week returns and continues today. Our guest is Patricia Newman, the author of Sea Otter Heroes, Sa- Zoo Scientist to the Rescue, Plastic Ahoy, and Ebola. And she's here to talk to us about those books and how, how everyone can contribute to the advancement of science. Joining us on the line right now, one of the stars of STEM Week. We're so excited that she's back. She was here not too long ago talking about her book, Eavesdropping on the Elephants. We're here to talk uh, uh, about a really, really great subject. And uh, we'll re- reference a number of her, her other books, including Sea Otter Heroes and Zoo Scientists to the Rescue. Please welcome back to this show from Sacramento, Patricia Newman. Patricia, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm excited because, um, you know, I, I, I feel so lucky because you folks hear the interview that we have, and uh, but I get, I get to talk to my guests before and after the show, and and I'm just learning so much, and especially around STEM, this is you know like one of those those subjects, you know, sciences and technology has been one of these things that has kind of fascinated me, but. Uh, you know, I went into human services and then I studied magic. So I always felt like, oh, I can't talk to scientists. You know, it's, I'm intimidated. But this is great because I get a chance to, to talk to these really knowledgeable authors and scientists uh, about this thing. And one of the things Patricia and I talked about was the fact that you don't have to be a, a scientist with a degree in science to be uh, an integral part of a science team. And uh, I, I thought that was really cool. So why don't you just take it from there, Patricia, and, and talk to us about but, but what, you, what, what you would explain to me. Okay. Well, you know, it was really cool the way that this idea came to be because you had expressed interest in it. And I have to say, after five STEM books, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. So um, I guess I'll just kind of go book by book because uh-huh. that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, so if we, if anybody out there has listened to the podcast on eavesdropping on elephants, we'll we'll start with that one. So of course you have the scientists who conduct the um, experiments in the field, and they uh, gather observations. They gather um, sounds from the forest by posting their acoustic recorders in the trees, and then they take all of this data back to the lab and they analyze it and they run all kinds of statistics and, you know, very complicated things. And, of course, my goal when I write these books is to get kids interested in science, but let's face it, we're not all going to be scientists. Mm -hmm. So, just as an example, in order for the Elephant Listening Project to to be able to gather these sounds in the forest, they work with an engineer who creates a circuit board, much like a circuit board you would find in any computer, but it's quite small. Mm -hmm. And this circuit board is hardwired, is programmed to gather sound and to save it on a uh, an SD card, much like you would shove into a a digital camera. Mm -hmm. So somebody had to design that. And then there's another guy that works with the Elephant Listening Project who takes that circuit board And he looks at it, how fragile, how thin, how the wires are just soldered in place. And he thinks about the elephants and the chimpanzees and the buffalo in the forest who are very curious about anything that doesn't seem to belong. And he has to figure out how to protect this device. And he came up with a plastic lunchbox and he he packed the circuit board in foam and he, they together they all developed a way to attach it to the tree. So these are people that the Elephant Listening Project relies on. And then there are all of the student volunteers who listen to the recordings once they're brought back to the lab. And then this is really cool, and I just found out about this since our, our talk, Jed. I know that there's um, another Cornell alum 
uh, I think he graduated with a PhD from Cornell. He has an artificial intelligence firm, and he's super interested in computers. And he's written a program that will allow the Elephant Listening Project to listen, and I'm doing air quotes now, to listen to their recordings. But really, the computer is the one doing the listening. And instead of students laboriously picking out the elephant sounds hour by hour by hour, there's something like 600,000 hours of recordings, um, this computer program can do it, can do that for the scientists. And, so, and, th- and, and then there are people like accurate. us, mm-hmm. me and students out there who are spreading awareness. So we're all part of the elephants team. That's, uh, it's, it's amazing. And, and you don't think about it. You're right. I mean, I have, I have my, my trusty sidekick, Augie, my, my little beagle. And, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many sets of headphones I've gone through because he's just, uh, this is interesting. It has an interesting odor. I think I'll eat it. And, right. You know, and, and he's a 26 pound, be- well, he's a chubby beagle. But, you know, imagine, you know, a big water buffalo in, in the forest finding a, a device that, that they, you know, or an elephant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this it really is a team of people with a lot of varied skills working together to find out this information. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. In um, Zoo Scientists to the Rescue, uh-huh. of course, we have the scientists. We have a woman who studies orangutans. We have another um, man who studies black-footed ferrets in terms of um, breeding them and uh, training them to release them into the wild again. And then we have a, um, an endocrinologist who studies feces. Uh-huh. And um, these scientists all work at different zoos, and of course, uh, they and their lab assistants are, are critical to the whole um, book. But other people that are also critical to the survival of endangered species and spreading the zoo's message are the zookeepers themselves. My daughter is a zookeeper, so I know exactly what they do. Uh-huh. The docents, those volunteers at zoos who direct you to the right place and tell you about the plants and man those little... Uh, educational carts that you see everywhere. There's um, there's a question in my zoo scientist to the rescue that says, "Is your cereal killing orangutans?" And what that means is, are our packaged foods like cereal and snack foods are often made with palm oil, Ooh. and palm oil that's not farmed sustainably often um, damages the habitat that orangutans live in. So there is an app that you can download on your smartphone. It's called the Palm Oil app. And so there are those app developers that are supporting orangutans just by cluing us into which foods have non-sustainable palm oil and which use sustainable palm oil. There's... um, Meredith, who was the one who lived in Borneo and studied orangutans, she actually built with her own two hands a little study center, a a, a, a lodging Uh and um, uh, docks for the boats, and she hired a cook. So that cook is one of the supporters of the scientists. You know, it goes down to something very, very um, simple. When they release, when um, the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, which is one of the zoos and zoo, zoo scientists to the rescue, releases black-footed ferrets after um, breeding them in the zoos, they work in cooperation with ranchers and American Indians and other landowners to be sure that when they release the ferrets that they will be safe. So this is, this is something that extends far beyond science to to public policy and, and um, a- acting on behalf of, of animals and technology, all different. That, this is why I love science, because yeah. it affects every single area of our lives. Yep. And, and we can contribute no matter what we, I mean, you were th- thinking about the zoo and uh, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, the teenagers who were, who were picking up trash and serving snacks 
they're contributing in their own unique way to keeping the zoo going and keeping it clean and, and helping this research keep going. Exactly. And with Zoo Scientists to the Rescue, I worked with a photographer by the name of Annie Crawley. And she and I also worked on Plastic Ahoy. Uh-huh. So Annie is somebody through her photography, for, through her, her um, filmmaking, constantly spreads a message of eco-awareness and conservation. And somebody like that who likes to take pictures or who has a, a knack for visual storytelling. Those kinds of people are part of the scientist team. Mm-hmm. Because often scientists are so incredibly busy that they don't have the time or they don't have the access or the wherewithal to make the videos or package the the study or the finding or the discovery in a pretty um, uh, wonderful way sure. that um, people can understand. Sure. Well, there's... No kid out there and very few adults who are going to want to sit down and read uh, a scientific paper. Uh, you know, they're not, exactly. able, not able to understand. Nobody's going to want to do that. But, but sitting down and seeing the pictures. And now, Plastic Ahoy, is, you're, t- you're talking about the plastic, that giant plastic island that's kind of s- swirling around in the Pacific Ocean. Um, seeing that visually, that, that's a wake-up call. You know, and yes, you, you, and and that's that, that's such a valuable that that those pictures are such a valuable tool to the people who want to address this issue. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and to and to um, further those examples with plastic ahoy investigating the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Again, it wasn't just the scientists, but the scientists chartered a research vessel. That research vessel has a captain that pilots that ship safely out into sea. That vessel has a crew that keeps the scientists safe when there's a storm at sea or keeps the lab equipment in good working order. So all of these people support science. You don't have to be a scientist to support science. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just be, because I just don't want to gloss over it, that, that garbage patch, how big... Is it the garbage pat? You know, the media makes it sound like it's a solid island mm-hmm. of trash, mm-hmm. and it isn't really. There are some solid pieces, yes, but most of the pieces are no bigger than our pinky fingernail because by the time it gets to the North Pacific Central Gyre, it's been in the water for a long time and it photo degrades and the wave action and the friction of the waves uh, break the the plastic up into smaller pieces but it's still plastic Mm -hmm. so most of what the scientists in Plastic Ahoy were picking up were these tiny little popcorn kernel sized pieces Ah, fascinating but it's everywhere just as a for instance the expedition with these, these scientists in Plastic Ahoy, did 132 net toes, meaning they threw nets in the water 132 different times, dragged them away, picked up the nets, and saw what they, what they gathered. Mm-hmm. Out of these 132 net toes, plastic was in 130 of them. You, you know, so it's everywhere. Yeah, and you bring up a good point because... You know, we, you're you're talking about how the media presents this thing as this big solid island of of plastic, and it really is different. So, it's really important that we have writers and photographers and people who are very interested in getting the science right and getting the information out there correctly. Uh, yes, the, the people in the in the traditional media uh, they have other goals. It's, not to say that their goals are, are wrong, but they're looking to sell newspapers and get people to click and, and see things. And uh, it's much more, it, it, you know, a, a story about a giant solid island of garbage swirling around in the Pacific Ocean is going to get a lot more attention than the, the accurate um, information. But that accurate information is important for us to understand because that we really need to deal with that. 
Right, and these tiny little pieces are more insidious mm -hmm. even than these big giant milk jugs or or fishing nets because um, animals, small animals, start to eat them. The smaller the pieces, the smaller the animal that can eat them. Mm -hmm. And these small animals become food for the larger animals. So there's this whole idea of bioaccumulation of the toxins in plastic. And in fact, Annie Crawley and I were just talking, the photographer I told you about, and she said that the PCPs in the water, the PCPs are one of the chemicals that go into making plastic, are being stored in orca's fat cells. So when they go hungry for you know certain periods of time, like they usually do, they're starting to digest mm -hmm. these fat cells, if you will, yeah. and the PCPs are winding up in their bloodstream. Wow. Also, it's been proven that orcas are breathing, you know, whales have the blowhole on the tops of their heads, right? So when orcas come up and take a breath, microfibers are being spewed out of their blowholes oh. in the water. Oh, such a problem, such a problem. And so thankful that we have these teams of scientists and, and ship captains and photographers and writers to help us understand that so we can become part of the team and our kids can be part of the team to start to find a solution. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's that's my whole goal is to, to make kids understand that not only do they have a voice, but their voices are important mm -hmm. and they can start now. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think this is just so critical to understand that you can be part of a scientific team even though you're not a scientist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was one of the things that, that kind of led me uh, in, in looking at these different things. What, you know, my daughter um, uh, wanted to get into the music business, and she had always been a dancer when she was, you know, a young kid, and she was always in the school musicals. And when she told me when she was in middle school that no, I, I, I don't want to be on stage, and I don't want to be a star, but I do want to be in the music business, it, it shocked everyone. But I had an understanding that, yeah, there's a lot of people who go into making music, making uh, music and live music and recorded music happen, not just the right. four or five people you see in the spotlight. Right. I, I want I wanted to talk because I'm sitting here and I have a bit of a cold and a flu and I have a stuffy nose and I apologize for that. But there's another book that you wrote, another team of scientists that you wrote about who studied Ebola. And I don't have Ebola, so don't, don't worry. But uh, <laughs> while we talk about that, talk about that team that, uh, that, that looked into this really serious illness. Well, you know that Ebola is um, currently, there's an Ebola outbreak in the Congo that they're worried might turn into epidemic, an epidemic as it crosses the Ugandan border right now, right as we speak. Uh -huh. um, the thing about Ebola is... The epidemic is unstoppable without a team of people working together. Not just the doctors and the nurses, but the volunteers who take their time and care for Ebola patients in these outposts where there's really not much modern medical care, modern by our standards. There are teams of local people who track down who the first patient was because it's very important uh, epidemiologists have to understand who the first patient was to maybe understand where the Ebola was first contracted and then how it spread to the community wow. so that lots of volunteers do that lots of volunteers have incredibly grisly duties such as um, cleaning the medical tents or burying the dead. You can't just bury a, a dead Ebola patient. You have to swath that person in plastic and it has to be that person has to be handled very, very carefully. And everybody who touches an Ebola patient has to be fully gowned and gloved and protected. And in fact there's a very specific way to put on and take off those protective garments. So when you see an epidemic, whether it's Ebola or influenza or SARS or AIDS, 
that epidemic will never go away without a huge team of people working pretty much tirelessly mm-hmm. to to keep everybody safe. Yeah. I mean, just as you were speaking, you're talking about the the, 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 the the people working with the patients have to be gowned in a certain way. So not only are those those people who are there with the patients contributing, but the people who make those gowns and the people who transport those gowns to the exactly. area, they're exactly. all part of the team. They're all part of the team. And the, one of the reasons I like this Ebola book, um, writing about an infectious disease, was a little bit different for me. But I like this Ebola book because if you have questions about Ebola, whether you're a child or an adult, this is a great book to pick up because it answers a lot of questions and for those of us here in the United States, really puts our minds at ease. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily why my publisher wanted to wanted me to write this book is because a lot of kids during the 2014 epidemic had real questions. They were scared. And, um, you know, when I went to school and talked about Ebola, I noticed that, remember remember when we were kids, kids always used to say, oh, you have cooties, I don't want to uh-huh. sit next to you, <laughs> right? It was yeah. cooties, right, whatever they were. Well, now it's Ebola. Oh, you have Ebola, I don't want to sit next to you. Uh-huh. You know, so it's, whether they understand it or not, it's part of their lives. Right, right, yeah. And it, it, and it is, it's so important that we understand and we give people good information, accurate information, so they understand how serious a situation is, but not to overblow it so that we're, you know, ostracizing people and not getting them the, the help that they need. Right, exactly. I think that the best thing that can happen from reading a STEM book is understanding. Uh-huh. And once you understand, you can start to ask intelligent questions or you can start to look at some of the news coverage that and, and figure out well how is that slanted and in fact the, the Ebola book is a great lesson in media literacy for uh-huh. kids uh-huh. because there was a lot of incorrect information that came out of the 2014 Ebola epidemic yeah. and, and and I'm just sitting here and I'm, uh, I'm thinking how how wonderful a conversation could be uh, talk with a family just talking about the value of everyone, everyone's work and everyone's effort. Uh, when young magicians talk to me, and you know, I always tell them, uh, you know, if you're working in a school, you're working in a theater, you got to be nice to the custodians and the right. secretaries and the backstage people because without them, you can't put on this show and to really value their their effort and their contribution. And I think. I really think that that is a great thing for all of us, uh, for all of our kids to understand that uh, you know that everybody who's contributing, whether it's the scientist or it's the custodian in the lab, they're all contributing very important um, roles to to make every make our community better. So one of my my favorite stories has to do with my book Sea Otter Heroes. Uh-huh. This scientist discovered that sea otters were saving an entire ecosystem, a seagrass ecosystem. And he had a lot of volunteers working with him. But the most surprising helpers, they were helpers and they didn't even know it. These were people that had taken a tour of the Elkhorn Slough with a tour operator over a 20-year time period. And as they were taking this tour, they were handed a clicker. And, you know, one person was counting sea otters, another person was counting herons, another person was counting jellies, another person was counting pelicans. And at the end of the tour, every day, two or three times a day, the captain and the naturalist would compile all this data, write it down on a sheet, and stuff it in a binder. Well, when Brent Hughes came along, the scientist and sea otter heroes, he was trying to figure out, why in the world is seagrass so healthy when the Elkhorn Slough is the most nutrient-polluted estuary on the planet? Mm -hmm. So this was a real puzzle for him, and every single aspect of science that he knew about did not answer the question. 
Somebody suggested to him, why don't you go look at Captain Gideon's files? He's been taking data for 20 years. And he, he Brent overlaid that data with the health of seagrass uh-huh. and found a nearly perfect correlation with the numbers of sea otters in the Elkhorn Slough versus the health of seagrass. Wow. So if it hadn't been for all of those people taking those tours and recording that data, he might not have solved the problem. And it's just happenstance, really. Wow. And it, it just blows my mind that we those people were helping science, and they didn't even know it. I had no idea. That's What a beautiful story. I, I love that. I love that. And I, I, and I just... I just – the more we speak, the more I am falling in love again with STEM because it is – it's something that everybody can contribute to. Uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, you don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be a rocket science. You, Whatever it is that you are – whatever talents you're born with, you can contribute to making the world a better place and advancing our knowledge. And I love – I, I love that we have this chance to talk about this because, um, you know, I don't want kids to get left by the wayside. You know, it's great that we're talking about STEM now and the quote unquote nerdy kids, are, you know, maybe getting more attention and kind of seen as cooler. Uh, but I don't want anybody who doesn't fall into that to kind of be left aside. It's, it's, it's a great way for us to, to value everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is great. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Well, Patricia, re- please remind everybody of your website where they can find out more about you and all of your fantastic books. I'm at Patricia M. Newman, N E W M A N dot com. Patricia M. Newman dot com. And you go there, you can find out about sea otter heroes and zoo scientists to the rescue, plastic ahoy. Ebola, and of course, my fave, eavesdropping on the elephant. <laughs> I can't wait to your next visit to the show. We've had so much fun. Patricia Newman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jed. It was a pleasure. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. STEM Week continues. We welcome Anna Maria Rodriguez to the show to talk about her book, The Secret of Scuba Diving Spiders and Other Amazing Animal Creature Secrets. Hey, if you're the author of a great children's book, you don't want to keep it a secret. You want to let the world know all about it. Well, we can help you celebrate your book. We can help you celebrate your book. Being a guest on the Reading With Your Kids podcast gives you the chance to let thousands and thousands of people know all about your great book because you're not only a guest here on the show, which is heard by thousands of folks, but we also tweet about you, we post about you, we spread the world to our huge social media following. So it, it, it's a no-brainer. Being on the show gives you a chance to let thousands and thousands of people know about your great book. And check this out. Being a guest in the show, it's fun, it's easy, and wow, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. All you need to do is go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, click on the contact button, let us know about your great book. We'll let you know the very, very easy and fun next steps. Hey, want to thank Patricia Newman for being here today, talking to us about how everybody, no matter what their skill sets are, can contribute to the advancement of science and knowledge in the world today. And oh, wow! We want to thank you because every single day you are helping your child understand that they have wonderful talents and abilities that are going to help make the world a better place. And you do that every time you sit down and read with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.